welcome to our second virtual conversation in the Representation Matters program, From Hollywood Stereotypes to Social Activism, Asian Americans in the Media. This series is hosted by the George Washington Carver Museum and Cultural Center, a cultural institution dedicated to honoring African American heritage, arts and culture in Arizona, and Arizona Humanities, the Arizona affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Since 1973, Arizona Humanities has supported public programs that promote understanding of the human experience with cultural, educational, and nonprofit organizations across Arizona. This program was funded by the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative, administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Karen Quill. Associate Professor of Asian Pacific American Studies and the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. And before I hand this over to Dr. Karen Quill, before we get started, for our audience viewing this webinar, the best viewing option is going to be in the full screen mode. So you can adjust that in the top right hand corner of the webinar window to see that full screen. Um, if you have any questions during this talk, um, feel free to use the Q&A function, which should be located at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to those questions. Um, we also have the chat enabled um, so that you can interact with each other, as well as Dr. Karen Quo, who may be asking you all some questions during her presentation. Um, and today's session will be recorded, and that recording will be made available on our website at azhumanities.org, as well as the Carver Museum's website at carveraz.org. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Karen Quo. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for inviting me and um, to all the participants that are participating. Um, today, um, I want, before we began, I wanted to actually uh, do a land uh, acknowledgement. Um, ASU is located on the ancestral homelands where I'm actually, you know, working of American Indian tribes that have inhabited and cared for this land for centuries, including the Akimelo Odom and the Peeposh people. I recognize and continually affirm the sovereignty of Native nations in this territory and beyond. My acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to hold ASU and my communities accountable to American Indian people and nations and to work to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. So I'm gonna um, share my screen. And Dr. Crow, oh, perfect. Okay, just took some time. Okay. So, um, I sort of wanted to begin um, with um, looking at media and then sort of talking about activism. And, and this is just sort of an overview of um, what's to come. And I, I think Julianne and I had talked about like, if there are questions, I'm happy to take them um, in the Q&A. Maybe if um, there are questions that pop up in the Q&A, Julianne, you can, you can just alert me or you can read them and stop me and we could we could do that to be more interactive. Um, or I can just simply go through and, and you guys can ask questions after we're flexible with that. Um, so I just wanted to preface this by saying that, you know, even though I have the title Asian Americans that I'm really gonna be mostly focusing on East Asian representations because a lot of the media representations have you know, predominantly depicted mostly East Asians, so Chinese and Japanese. It doesn't mean that um, there aren't depictions of South Asians or Southeast Asians or Filipinos, and they come at different historical points in time um, with US relations with these areas and um, these countries. Um, so I just wanted to preface it with that because, um, you know, there is, of course, this sort of domination of East Asia when we say Asian Americans. So when we say Asian Americans, sometimes people only talk about like East Asians and other, other groups often get marginalized. So controlling images, what does this mean? Patricia Hill Collins coined the term controlling images to explain the power of stereotypes 
that dehumanizes and maintains the subordination and exploitation of black women, mammies, Jezebels. But this term has also been useful to explain how stereotypes and controlling images that we see of other marginalized groups, such as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and how they perpetuate racism and continue to produce and reproduce the same stereotypes that diminish, at times dehumanize, and even provoke racial animus and violence towards Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, which I will not be addressing fully. Um, how, do we, how do these media portrayals affect actual Asians? We have to understand that media is not static and that culture is ever changing. Representations do matter and they can be deployed to reflect our cultural beliefs and mores, not to mention that this is also structural too in the media. So who runs these venues and you know, in these pictures, so you can probably see, we could probably, um, I could probably sort of open this up. I don't know how many people recognize some of these pictures in these films. Um, so the first one to, would it be, it's my left, but maybe it's to your right, um, is Mr. Yunioshi in, Breakfast at Tiffany's, he's played by a white man, um, Mickey Rooney. The middle picture is the mask of Fu Manchu. It's actually the mask of Fu Manchu and the Fu Manchu stories were based on these sort of pulp fiction novels that were written around the turn of the century about Britain's Chinatowns um, by an author named Sax Romer. And in fact, after, you know, he made a lot of money and he was very, very popular and they made him into movies. But then later he said, you know, actually I've never even been to Chinatown. So he's writing these stories um, based on, you know, stereotypes that he's, he's also learned about. And then this last one is um, a picture of Louise Rayner, who is an actress that played um, in the film called The Good Earth, which is based on the novel by Pearl S. Buck, of the same name in 1932. So what do all these people have in common? Well, they're all white. So they're all white, but they're playing Asians. And so this points back to the ways in which the studios had a lot of control. They didn't want to, you know, it's this kind of, we all face this with this kind of strange thing because um, like people knew that these were white people playing Asians, <laughs> but at the same, so there's this kind of like understanding there's a lack of authenticity, but yet the representations themselves, like for example, in the good earth, were very, we're supposed to be very authentic. This is how real Chinese peasants actually behave and act. Um, and so, but in doing so, um, they they made it possible for white actors to get paid and Asian actors to not get paid. And so in some of these films, like for example, The Good Earth, there were real Asian Americans that were in the film, but they were often have second secondary or tertiary um, roles. So unlike blackface, which would probably be sort of analogous to yellowface where, um, you know, the sort of dawning of the black face of, of white people, there's a lack of authenticity for Asians in film or fake Asians in film. There's both caricature, stereotype, but also presenting it as authentic. And this is part of a longer history of presenting Asians within what's called an Orientalist worldview. Deriving from long-standing images of Asians as Orientals, Orientalism describes how the West or the Occident portrays the East or the Orient. U.S.'s inheritance of European Orientalism divided the world between East and West, where the East was irrational, ungovernable, populated by people who are inferior to the West, and the West, which represents the normative and the rational and the progress of civilization. These notions were already around before Asians immigrated to the U.S., so they did not necessarily just develop out of nowhere in the U.S. European colonization and hegemony in the East from West Asia and North Africa to East and Southeast Asia and South Asia based their rationale for domination and subordination of the people in Asian countries in order to colonize, occupy, and exploit the resources of yellow, of labor and environment. Yellow peril is a term describing the fears of seeing Asians within a Manichaean dichotomy. So this is, you know, between good and evil as threatening. This includes military and immigration threats, but also threats of disease and contagion, as we can see probably recently this year, or of miscegenation, or such as interracial relationships, mostly between whites and Asians. 
Focused narrowly on East Asia as a threat, yellow peril has been the term and phenomenon that best describes the US historical and contemporary racial animus and xenophobia towards Asian and Asians. Stereotypes of Asian American men and women in Hollywood and what they have captured from US history's engagement and conflict with Asia and Asians began with this inheritance of Orientalism. Early immigration and labor conflict with Asian immigrants who came like many European immigrants did to build the US during industrialization were part of nativist propaganda and seen as taking away gainful labor from white people. Immigration laws excluding Asians and anti-naturalization laws further made Asians unassimilable as unassimilable foreigners. US wars with Asia, such as with Japan, Korea, and then Vietnam drew on Orientalist stereotypes that deemed Asians as enemies and evil. Historical representations, however, have in addition um, to reproducing the foreignness of Asians was also framed in sexual and gendered ways. So this is a really lovely, wonderful picture of Anna Mae Wong was one of the first Asian American, she's Chinese American actress. Um, and uh, she's kind of here depicted as a dragon lady, which is one of the stereotypes. Stereotypes of Asian women are often polarized in that Manichaean dichotomy I talked about earlier between good and evil. So we have the dragon lady, right, in, in, in the previous photo, as well as between China dolls and geishas who are subordinate, passive, and inherently desirous of pleasing men. So these two pictures here, just this a little bit. Um, one is from the world of Suzy Wong, which is, um, about Nancy Kwan actually plays Suzy Wong, who's a, a stereotype of the um, Asian prostitute with the heart of gold. And then the other one with Marlon Brando and um, the, the Japanese American woman's um, actress's name is uh, Sayonara, which is about an interracial relationship of American GI right after the Korean War with the Japanese woman. So some of these sort of recurring um, stereotypes you can see are prostitute, they keep recurring, the geisha, the lotus blossom, or what I said, the china doll. But in all these cases, um, Asian women are exotic and eroticized as, as objects of Asian femininity. So they are also seen as war booty as well, as particularly during the Vietnam War era films, right after the Vietnam War. And in this way too, given the wars with Asian countries because of the ways that Asian women are represented in film is that they are sort of metonymically or metaphorically representative of Asian nations. So it becomes that you have this white Western US masculine nation that overpowers and dominates um, the uh, Asian nations, which are, are the defeated Asian nations. So how are Asian men then depicted within this um, also constellation of um, racial and gender tropes of Asians? This image of gendered nationalism also transfers to the way that US media depicts Asian American men. So Asian American men and Asian men are also depicted in some respects as being sort of metaphors of Asian nations as well. So while Asian women are highly sexualized and objectified, Asian men are seen as absent of sexual or erotic appeal and even strength. They are evil and menacing on the one hand. And on the other hand, they are also seen as geeky, you know, houseboys. Um, you can see in some of these pictures, the difference between the geeky, the sort of ineffectual Asian man, Asian American man and, um, you know, this might sort of date me, but of course that was my generation of films, the John Hughes films with Getty Watanabe who played, um, I think he played like a Chinese or a Japanese foreign exchange student um, in one of the films, 16 Candles. So earlier representations of Asian men in the US Bill also viewed them as possessing aberrant sexuality. So in addition to the sort of evilness either as homoerotic or as violators of white womanhood. 
or in other ways, as we see with um, in the 16 candles as emasculated. Asian men are constantly peddled to us in US media as houseboys, nerdy geeks, and rarely seen as romantic interests. Although there are better representations in our media in the last two decades, we're still seeing mostly absent images. So for example, Asian American Pacific Islander children do not see themselves on media as much as Latinx or black children. Even the crazy rich Asians popularity took something like 25 years for another all Asian American cast to occur. And the 25 years ago was the Joy Luck Club. And it's also very specifically East Asian representation. So there were also some criticisms um, after Crazy Rich Asians came out because it takes the whole film actually takes place in Singapore. And so a lot of people were like, where are the South Asians? Where are the Southeast Asians and the Filipinos? And they were definitely absent in the film. So I have some pictures here with um, no captions. Um, I'm not able actually to see the Q&A, um, Julianne, maybe, or the chat. I don't know if anyone wanted to type in what any of these characters in here look familiar and who they might be. We don't have anyone who's typed a question yet, but if you, if anyone in the audience wants to use the chat to, um, to speak to any of the images that Dr. Crow is showing us right now, I mean, um, I'm familiar with some of these myself, and I'm sure you all are too. Um, so if you want to just type in the chat, like any of them that you're familiar with, your thoughts on them. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I think that. Uh, so, so Karen um, says Apu from The Simpsons. Um, that was the first character I recognize, and I feel like he's been a lot in the news a lot. Yeah, yeah. Hula girl. I don't know if anyone knows. Yeah, the hula girls. Um, someone said maybe Pan Am ads. Yeah, I think so. They're pretty old. Um, they I, they look like they came from the fifties. Yes, and then um, Devi in in the chat said Ashwari yeah. Roy. Ashwari Roy. Yeah. So she's not really an Asian American actress, but she's probably a pretty good crossover in terms of Bollywood. Um, you know, and I'm not talking like Bollywood, like Madonna pretending to be South Asian with the bindi and the henna and everything. <laughs> but as, um, and, but you know, even sort of the crossovers that we have, it's like, she's a very light skin South Asian woman, right? We don't see a lot of dark skin, um, often not a lot of dark skin Asians. Um, so this is actually Rob Schneider from 51st Dates. He's playing, he actually plays like, his character is so demeaning. He, he, he plays this like dumb Hawaiian, speaking Hawaiian pigeon in the film. And um, interestingly too, I don't know why they asked him to play this film, but it, it, it's a little bit yellow faced or Pacific Islander face, but at the same time, it's also, um, his maternal grandmother is actually Filipina. Okay, so <laughs> yes, yeah, he totally is Filipino, <laughs> one quarter Filipino. So these pictures, um, you might not be able to read. One of them says, the one with the, the fan, memoirs of a geisha. Yep, Karate Kid, the original Karate Kid. Um, and Mr. Miyagi, Karen, yes. Karen in the chat, um, I think you're chatting to all panelists. So if you want everyone to see um, what you're chatting, make sure to put it to all panelists and attendees. I think she's kind of named all of them. Oh yeah. So it's Mr. Miyagi, Jackie Chan and Lucy Liu plays, she's in that movie Kill Bill, the Quentin Tarantino film. I think we have another person in the chat, Carl, saying Jackie Chan. I That's remember. right. Jackie Chan did have an animated show. I remember <laughs> that. I think my kids actually watched that. <laughs> I've forgotten about that. Yeah. So then we have these really popular, like, obviously, you know, like I know Kill Bill was sort of like this tongue in cheek and it was a Quentin, film, but it still has very sort of Orientalist stereotypes. And then, of course, there's the controversy with Memoirs of a Geisha. 
which is was actually an interview of a geisha based on a book, but that was um, written by a white man who um, later on it was found out that he had just sort of stolen her story and published it. Okay. So how do these images, images not remotely capture anything to what Asian Americans were doing and about? And how did Asian American movements resist and challenge stereotypes while also empowering Asian Americans? So this picture here was taken by Corky Lee, a Chinese American activist, organizer, and photographer who took numerous photos of Asian Americans that were generally not seen in the popular media. Lee uh, passed away recently on, in January, 2021. And he helped a generation of Asian Americans see themselves when most of the images of them and with photos and films were the ones that I've just showed you in Hollywood. Actually quite a lot of evidence of resistance and mobilizing for civil rights. And I'll just give you one, like one very sort of early and notable one in history um, that sort of shows this kind of opposite image from what I just showed you with these media images, which shows you know, the passivity, the ineffectualness of Asians, unless they're being super evil, right? Um, because they're part of that Manichaean dichotomy. Some of the earliest um, activisms were of citizenship and naturalization rights. Since Asians could not become naturalized citizens based on the interpretation of the 1790 naturalization law that reserved citizenship for white people only, this was tested by two Asian American men, one Japanese American, Takao Ozawa, who, basically tested the theory of, um, of racial whiteness and said, um, a, a skin whiteness, skin color whiteness, and said that his skin is lighter than most of the Europeans that are coming in and are able to naturalize. And the court said, well, actually you're of mongoloid descent. So you actually are not white and you cannot become a citizen. A couple of years later, Bhagat Singh Thind, um, who is a, a Sikh American who fought in World War I and was a veteran, uh, tested the cultural definitions of whiteness by claiming his Caucasian roots. Um, he was also denied because the court said, well, yes, that, that might be true that you are actually Caucasian based on these racial theories, but um, any white man on the street can see that you are not white. So they deemed him as not culturally white. So in these, both of these cases, we see that Asian Americans were not the silent model minority and questioned how civil rights should be upheld by a country that professes democracy. The Asian American movement and pan-Asian American identity came into being as a politically acknowledged organization and identity in 1969 um, for the, I mean, it, not, you know, right at 1969, but there was this sort of conference called the Asian American Experience in America, Yellow Identity at UC Berkeley. Asians of diverse ethno-cultural linguistic backgrounds shared a common bond of being Asians in the US, treated as if they were, treated as if they were monocultural because of racism that did not differentiate them, differentiate them. And at the same time, they understood that there was a need to build ethnic solidarities amongst each other and amongst different Asian groups. The conference also revealed other interests and um, the diversity of Asian Americans as well. So some of them were very politicized um, and didn't feel that they were just sort of being dominated by this sort of ethnic racial identity. Asian Americans also joined and were part of anti-war protests, anti-Vietnam War and third world liberation struggles, seeing their fates as linked to those who have been colonial subjects of European and the US globally. The Third World Liberation Front were a series of protests led by a multiracial group of students and activists that took place in at San Francisco State and UC Berkeley between 1968 and 1969. Protests were over the treatment of students of color, how students of color were treated, Asian Americans, Black, Latinx, Chicano, and American Indian students, and the lack of representation of faculty of color and administrators, the need for the establishment of an ethnic studies curriculum and department, and the anti-Vietnam War movement. Asian American activists and organizers were also involved in the civil rights movement, supporting Black liberation as much as for the liberation of other marginalized groups in the US, such as themselves. Yuri Kochiyama and Grace Lee Boggs are two examples of Asian American women who devoted their lives to multiracial coalition building as activists for social justice and change and for human rights. 
Kochiyama, as a young girl, was imprisoned with her family in Jerome, Arkansas, one of the 10 Japanese American internment camps during World War II. Her husband, Bill Kochiyama, fought in the all Japanese American 442nd Battalion during World War II. Yuri and Bill's experiences motivated them to organize against the injustices for all marginalized groups. They were also formatively involved in the struggle for black liberation and did, did this through building Asian American political movements that would be in solidarity with black power and liberation movements. Yuri met Malcolm X in 1963, joining his movement, the Organization for Afro-American Unity and was cradling his head after he was shot. Grace Lee Boggs, like Yuri Kochiyama, was a political activist, human rights activist, and labor activist and organizer who also worked to build multiracial coalitions and solidarities. A second generation Chinese American whose parents worked and owned a Chinese restaurant business, Grace became politicized as a young woman reading about Marxism. She worked as a tenant organizer in the 1940s and in the 50s met her husband, James Boggs, who was an auto worker, writer, and radical activist in Detroit. The Boggs identified with the Black Power movements, but also in, the, in her career, Grace spent her life fighting and organizing for the rights of all people who were dispossessed, creating co-ops for communities, organizing workers and writing and fighting for racial and social justice. Other multiracial coalitions were built as well by Asian Americans. Larry Itliong, a Filipino American labor organizer and migrant farm worker helped organize the Delano grape worker strike between 1965 and 70. Filipino migrant, American migrant farm workers who worked alongside Mexican American migrants helped lead the change, lead the charge for the grape worker strike alongside Cesar Chavez. Few know that it was the Filipino farm workers organizing with Mexicans that made the grape worker strike so powerful and influential. Asian Americans also try to change how we see ourselves and other AAPIs. So with the growth of public funding in the late 60s and 70s in the media and arts, there was an opportunity to challenge historical filmic representations of Asians. And this group here, which is part of the visual communications group came out of UCLA. They were filmmakers um, out of the UCLA Film School. And they were really influenced by the civil rights movement, black liberation, the third world movements and the Asian American movements. They created a series of now canonical documentaries about Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders for Asian Americans. And so their goal was like not to say we wanted to tell everyone, but we wanted to provide this as an education for our community so that they can learn about their own histories and their own identities and their struggles. So it was really sort of seen as, um, you know, in practical ways, like, you know, let's teach kids how to think about certain things, how to think about racial identity. Um, how do we get elderly to, um, you know, participate more in the community. And then there were, you know, they had a couple of feature length films as well, one about Japanese Americans. Um, there were documentaries about um, the Chinese laundryman, which was one of um, one of the filmmakers' fathers, who he did a documentary of his father working as a laundryman and what that actually meant. So these were kinds of images that were not they were not talked about. They were not shown. And this is the whole history of Asian Americans since the turn of the century was basically silent. And many of these filmmakers saw this opportunity as a way um, to tell our own communities this is what we're about. At the same time that Asian Americans were moving toward their own politicized movements and identity and building solidarities with other people of color, the appearance of the model minority image was also being circulated. How was the Asian model minority deployed and how did this create a racial triangulation between mostly blacks and whites? Seen as thriving and doing well despite racism and racist legislation of immigration exclusion and anti-citizenship laws, Asian Americans, mostly Chinese and Japanese, as this picture actually depicts, were seen as thriving because of their families and cultural background and practice. Here we see that Confucian values of hard work ethic and filial piety, piety contrasts with the Daniel Moynihan report on black families as a tangle of pathologies. Unlike blacks and even American Indians and Chicanos, Asians demonstrated the validity of meritocracy in the US that if you work hard, you can succeed despite racism. 
The other persistent stereotype of Asian Americans is the perpetual or forever foreigner. Two prominent cases that mobilize Asian American post-civil rights era point to the stubbornness of these stereotypes and how they continue to affect Asian Americans. The brutal murder of Vincent Chin in 1982 by two white men, Ron Evans and his stepson, Michael Nitz, galvanized Asian American activists and organizations around the country and even internationally. In the midst of the auto industry layoffs during the 1980s, the belief that China that Chin was Japanese and was responsible for the recession and unemployment can be demonstrated in the utterance from Evans who said to him, it's because of you MFs that we're out of work before he was bludgeoned to death with a baseball bat by Evans with a son who held Chin. The initial trial acquitted the two men of manslaughter which became an outrage to Asian Americans across the country and incited mass organizing to retry the men based on a violation of Chin's civil rights. Wen Ho Lee in 1999, in 1999, Wen Ho Lee, who was a Los Alamos scientist, was investigated for downloading and giving materials on bombs to China. FBI and CIA, with no real evidence, accused him of espionage. He was imprisoned before any real facts were found, put in solitary confinement, and disallowed from even speaking Chinese to his family during his once a day phone call. When the Department of Energy did an investigation, uh, they found evidence of racial profiling um, towards Asian Americans with the Wen Ho Lee case. And I also have here, um, I, I can also send this PowerPoint and some of the links too in a separate um, document later, but I had it on this PowerPoint where there actually was a 2017 study which drew from other studies that showed when looking at Asian faces versus white faces speaking non-accented English, people consistently rated Asian faces as speaking with accents. So it just tells you how, you know, how even subliminal this sort of representation of being a foreign is um, of Asian Americans. Post 9-11, South Asians such as Sikh Americans were victims of racial profiling and hate crimes. The first hate crime death took place right after 9-11 in Mesa, Arizona, when Balbir Singh Sodhi was shot by a white man at a gas station. Sikh Americans, Arab and Muslim Americans became the new focus of racial animus that is both xenophobic and Islamophobic. With regard to Sikh Americans, one of my colleagues, and I don't think she's here, but expressed that the only time Sikhs are recognized is when tragedy occurs to them. So more recently with the, um, the shooter at the FedEx, um, a facility, um, you know, there were a number of Sikh, Sikh Americans who were shot. And they're also in 2012, if we recall in Oak Creek in Wisconsin, um, there was also a shooter um, of a, uh, a Sikh temple. So even though Sikh Americans, as we can see back in the slides before, one of them actually um, changed the ways in which um, citizenship laws were thought of, not, not in a good way because ultimately Sikhs, South Asians were denied citizenship, um, but we can see that they have been part of US history and they have been part of this land and part of um, um, the culture of America. And so when we see something like this happen, there's a lot of sort of ignorance around who Sikh Americans are. During this time um, at 9-11, Japanese Americans actually spoke out about their own history of racial profiling and incarceration by the US nation state. Japanese American civil rights organizations such as the JCL or Japanese American Citizens Leagues spoke out against the profiling of South Asian Arab and Muslim Americans who were seen by the US as national security threats and enemy aliens and cautioned the US government to not make the same mistake it did with Japanese Americans during World War II. More recently, with the surge of COVID-19, the growth of anti-Asian racism has intensified. According to the latest FBI hate crime report in 2019, hate crimes based on race, ethnicity, national origin account for 65.9% of all hate crimes in Arizona. When you compare that number to the 2020 hate crime reporting from the Phoenix Police Department, hate crimes based on race, ethnicity, national origin account for 75% of all hate crimes. When you look at the time trend, according to the research for the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at uh, California State University, San Bernardino that was published this last March, Phoenix experienced a 31% increase in total hate crimes from 2019 to 2021, 
but anti-Asian hate crimes increased by 50%. This means that there is 1.5 times more anti-Asian hate crimes, crimes occurring in Phoenix from 2019 to 2020. And this is a substantial change given how numerically small Asian Americans are. It's also important to note that the number of anti-Asian hate are likely grossly underreported due to multiple barriers of language, translation issues, not knowing who or where, who or where to report, fears that their stories would not be believed by the authorities and or taken seriously. There are numerous reports from the Stop AAPI Hate National Reporting Center where people shared their stories and they tried to report to the police, but they brushed it off or did not, or you know, they didn't consider it as motivated by hate, even though racial slurs were used. So it's also the interpretation of um, how they're interpreting um, racial hate. And of course, the Atlanta shooting of Asian Asian American women tests this issue of how racialized, how racialized Asian representations in our media provoke racially motivated violent behavior. The Atlanta shooting of six Asian Asian American women by the shooter who admitted to wanting to quell his sexual addiction has been seen by many Asian Americans, especially Asian American women, as both racially and sexually motivated based on the sexualized representations of Asian women in the media throughout the 20th and 21st century. So what are some of the things that we can do um, given all this? And um, what kinds of things um, are the community doing? Um, how can you be, for example, an active bystander in the face of racism? So some of these things, you know, people, sometimes even I don't, e I, I don't even know, right? Like how does one, um, even someone who's grown up facing racism her whole life. Sometimes we don't know how to be advocates for ourselves or for our communities and other people. Um, so we often have to retrain ourselves and our brains to learn how to be active bystanders to racism. A useful rule of thumb, which is provided by uh, Altruistic, a nonprofit that does bystander training is the three Ds, direct, distract and delegate. So direct means that you address the issue which doesn't need to be confrontational, but could be a checking in with the person who is the target. Hey, are you okay? Um, letting the perpetrator know that you're around um, or telling the perpetrator, cool, stop it. Sometimes just being there as a witness can dissuade a potential perpetrator. There's also distract or diversion in particular, which is useful if you see someone potentially um, being harmed, um, which could be just trying to get that person out of the space you and that person out of the space, the physical space, by creating something distracting, like, hey, we need to get back home. Why don't we go get a bite to eat? Anything. Delegate is probably something that you can later do to help prepare you and others who, um, which is getting friends who are good at being confrontational and speaking up and enlisting their help to help you and others. You can also actively practice speaking up in your workplace, at your kids' schools, at your school and campus community, and with your friends and family. And here I have a link for the Asian American um, Journalists Association. They've been doing virtual bystander trainings on, on, their, on their site. So again, I can send that link over as well. And here, um, if you look here at Hollerback, um, this is actually um, an advertisement from Hollerback. They also, um, organizations or even people can sign up and do anti-racism training and bystander racism training as well. You can also make yourself heard. Um, so how do you do that? You can vote, participate in civic engagement. You can educate by supporting your schools to adopt Asian Pacific American ethnic studies curriculum as they have done in California. And they're actually in the Phoenix school um, district. They've been trying to do this for a number of years, which is to try to get all the Phoenix schools through K through 12 schools to adopt ethnic studies curriculum. If you're a student or have kids that are at ASU or at you know K through 12 classes uh, schools, you know you can speak up as parents. If you are a student, you can ask to, to you know ask for Asian American Studies courses. Um, I just got an email this morning that actually University of Arizona is just is now offering an Asian Pacific American Studies minor. Now that's been really they've been really working hard for that for many decades. So. 
And also, um, I have a link here for AAPI resources, which was put together by our department and mostly by <laughs> one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Aggie Yellowhorse. So there's a list of things in there, which includes the PBS documentary on Asian Americans, which is a five part series. If you haven't watched it, you can go to the PBS site. Um, you can also donate um, to local AAPI community groups. So there's Island Liaison, there's Health Groups, Asian Pacific Community in Action, there's the Japanese American Citizen League, Arizona Chapter, there's the Asian Chamber of Commerce, and there's also our program, the ASU's Asian Pacific American Studies Program. And also you can support local Asian and Pacific Islander businesses. And you know, above all too, we have to think about thinking and practicing intersectionality, which is not you know, thinking about the multiple oppressions that we all face, but also building multiracial solidarity. So for example, anti-Asian racism is part of the same structure of ant fueling anti-Black racism and anti-Latinx anti-immigration. We need to speak up not just for our own communities, but also for others. Thank you. This is not me, by the way. Everyone always asks if this is a picture of me. This is actually from a documentary called My America Honk If You Love Buddha by Renee Tajima. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuo, for that, that lovely talk and all the resources that you shared at the end. Um, what I can do is if you send me your PowerPoint, I can share that with everyone who attended today. So um, you all will get that PowerPoint with all the links that Dr. Kuo was talking about. Um, so thank you so much. And if um, you have the audience, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A or the chat to go ahead and ask Dr. Crow any questions you might have about her presentation. Um, and also, um, I'm curious, as we're going through these questions, uh, what motivated you all to come today to today's talk, if you want to put that in that chat too. Um, we have a question from Lisa. Um, they ask, how can we educate non-Asian people about racism against Asians when they do not acknowledge that this racism exists? I find that people who say they are not racist don't really know what racism is. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, honestly, Lisa, that's something that we all struggle with too. Even very educated people can, can um, who you would assume would understand often don't understand. Um, racism. Um, you know, I haven't read it myself, but you can try, you know, um, giving them um, books to read, like really just recommending them, um, like Robin DiAngelo's book um, on white fragility. Um, there's also Carol Anderson's book, um, which is a little bit more heavy hitting called um, White Rage. And um, I think that speaking up actually is probably I don't think a lot of us realize how often we just kind of think, oh, you know, that person just doesn't understand and we're just not going to say anything. And um, I think the more people kind of, you know, challenge it, even if in, in a nice way, um, like you can also, you know, make it a joke, right? Like, oh, your English is really good. Um, oh, well, your English is really good too, right? Um, so it can be kind of, you know, passive aggressive. I'm all for passive aggressive <laughs> when it comes to like um, trying to um, destabilize racism. Um, but I think that the issue of white privilege is really, really hard to get through. And Honestly, I have gotten to a point where, you know, I, um, and Karen Leon actually said, Daryl Wing Sue's work on microaggressions is useful. And actually that is an example from um, Daryl where he says, you know, if someone says your English is really good, you can say back, well, your English is really good too, right? So those are some tactics that one can sort of use. Um, but I think the other issue too is that, um, as people of color, we actually need to collaborate and talk with other POC communities. And I, I think sometimes even Asian Americans and other groups, we tend to get sort of in our own sort of silos a little bit. And I, but I think that building those sort of multiracial coalitions make us more powerful in the face of being able to, um, you know, contradict racism, particularly um, from white people who are refusing to acknowledge it. But also that racism is um, that people, especially um, 
no one wants to be called out as a racist, right? That's like the worst thing ever. Um, <laughs> and so no one, it's like one of those blind things, right? So you get a lot of kind of colorblind um, comments where I don't see color, right? Um, and I think that ways in which we can sort of um, disable sort of that colorblind ideology is by making, making sort of their privilege as white persons visible? That wasn't a very good answer, I'm sorry. Um, I thought that was a, a great answer, um, very nuanced, and it's a tough question that I think we're all thinking about. We did get a couple of questions from Marin in the chat that I'm gonna ask before we get to the other questions in the Q&A. Um, Marin wants to know which agencies keep data on hate crimes against Asians in the state of Arizona, and where can one get training on active um, bystanders? Yeah, so I'm going to send Julianne um, the link to some of those, um, like the Asian, you can actually go to the Asian American Journalists Association site. Um, it's aaja.org. And then um, you can also, um, in terms of in terms of data, so the Stop API Hate is a national reporting center, but I believe because um, Dr. Yellow Horse, who is in our department, she's one of the research directors and she's been the one actually um, scrubbing and compiling the data. Um, there is data in Arizona, so it could be available on that site. And if I could also include um, um, a link, I think there is a link to the Stop API Hate. Great. Um, and then Carolyn has a question. Dr. Crow, what do you say when people ask, where are you from? <laughs> Um, I probably should just say, well, where are you from? I tell them I'm from California. And then they ask me again and I say, I'm from California. <laughs> and I just keep repeating it. Like I just refuse to give them the answer that they want. And eventually they, they get exasperated because part of that question too is people ask you, people don't understand the terms between race, nationality. So they'll ask you like, where are you nationally from? And I'll say, well, I'm from here. I'm from the US. <laughs> I'm an, actually a US citizen. And um, we got a question from John. Um, former Governor Napolitano had set, um, had a set of people of color advisory boards, African American, Asian American, Indigenous, Hispanic American, um, that gave um, people POC communities a voice and some representation in the state government. Should POC communities now work to compel or shame Arizona governors to revive that practice? Um, so this was when the governor was here, right? In Arizona or- okay. Palmer, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that actually the JCL recently wrote a letter to Governor Ducey about paying attention to anti-Asian racism. Um, and I believe I think I believe I saw Donna Chung, who was a former JCL Arizona chapter president, um, on this webinar. So that that's been fairly recent. I have not heard what the um, results of that are. Um, I definitely think that we should push back. We do have a very conservative legislature that has um, consistently denied, you know. Um, POCs, um, you know, the right to sort of speak up. Um, but I think, yeah, we, the change isn't going to happen unless we put pressure on the legislature and they need to hear. That's what I mean in terms of civic participation, right? Um, you know, even like, even if you don't want to sort of run for office, right, even as a city council member, you can sort of, you know, there's lots of numbers you can call, you can call your, you can call your, your governor. Um, and let them know. Um, also in the resources um, list, there should be, there's also something with the uh, attorney general where you can report to the attorney general um, about incidences, hate crimes. So these are things that, you know, it's hard to get them to listen, right? Um, but, and it's, it's hard on us because we have to perpetually be the ones to bring this up. Um, but it's one of those things where it's like, if we don't continually push against him, they'll continually be silent about it. And we have a question from HLT. Um, 
thanking you for your very rich and thorough history um, and your presentation. Um, and they're asking, what is the most compelling contemporary archetype of the AAPI community today that gives you pause? Hmm. Well, I guess I would disaggregate the AAPI, maybe just Asian American. Um, what would it, well, I think the model minority continues to shape and shift. And um, I've been doing some work on, you know, mothering. So of course the tiger mom has been <laughs> one of the worst things that have happened in recent years. Um, I think that um, the model minority, particularly with, um, you know, there's some conservative Asian Americans out there who actually believe that affirmative action is hurting them, um, that it's rewarding other people of color. And I think that that to me feels like the most sort of pernicious ar ar archetype of, of the model minority. Thanks for that very complicated question, HQ. <laughs> and we have a question in the chat that I'm going to get to from Michael. Um, and a question when you mentioned the crazy rich Asians, um, they said that, um, I think they thought you said it was only focused on Singaporeans. And I think Dr. Crow said it was set in Singapore, um, just to clarify, um, which was negative leaving out other Asian cultures. Do you think though that a more focused story on a specific ethnicity and culture only strengthens the narrative? I might've misinterpreted your point, but I feel as a person of color that sometimes these Hollywood films pander too widely, which detracts from the experience. Yeah, um, well, I mean, they didn't really, they only focused on a very sort of very privileged subset of Singaporeans. And I, I you know, I understand it's a Hollywood film, um, but, you know, it's kind of obvious. It's sort of, it's almost as, as obvious as like going, you know, having, having a film in Hawaii and there's only like white people and maybe a couple of East Asians. Like there's no Pacific Islanders. I think there was that movie Aloha or... Um, and that movie was terrible because that was actually in Yellowface where a white actress play, played being part Chinese and part, part Hawaiian. Um, so I, I think that there's a need sort of for accuracy. And so why have this film in Singapore? If you've been to Singapore, you know anything about it, you know it is a very multiracial, multicultural place. And there's many South Asians, Southeast Asians, as well as East Asians. There's a lot of mixed race people. And so it just, um, you know, I, I sort of could understand the criticism of it um, because it did become this kind of like East Asian film. Um, great, and we have another question in the Q&A from Lynn. Um, what can I say to a fellow artist who is white and who regularly portrays Japanese women in her artwork in a way that to me perpetuates the image of Asian women as demure and exotic I'm confident that she does it out of love of those images, but it hurts me to see it. So it's a little advice oh, for Dr. Wow. Yeah. So what can you say? I mean, is it love if they're not listening to you? So when you tell someone, even on a very basic level, like these images are racist, these images make me feel objectified, um, these images do not depict Japanese women in the way that in their diversity is either Japanese women or Japanese Americans, or maybe, you know, I don't know how they're, how they're depicting um, the Japanese women, but perhaps they're kind of sexualized or orientalized. And, um, you know, I, I would tell them that it's important that you educate yourself. You, you don't, you shouldn't have to educate your friend about this either. Like, there's a lot of great stuff on the web right now. You know, even if people won't read books and articles or journal articles, um, you know, you, you can point them to, um, you know, if you even just tell them to do a Google search, you know, <laughs> racism against Japanese women, they're gonna find a lot of stuff, right? And they're gonna find some weird stuff, but they're gonna find some good stuff too. Um, and so I would, um, that's what I would do, yeah. Great. And we have a lot of comments um, in the chat right now. So I'll just kind of read them as they're coming in. Um, we have something from CA saying, speaking of the film industry, does the role of Asian investors and production companies, i.e. H bros, and the subsequent broadening of Asian roles in these films give you any hope? Um, well, I mean, 
I want to say yes. <laughs> but then when you look at like 25 years of no Asian American cast, I think streaming actually is really kind of um, changed it. Um, and maybe you're not getting the kind of numbers. So, you know, because of there's so many different kinds of streaming, people can choose what they want to watch. But I know that the growth of Asian American writers um, has really sort of exponentially, you know, increased because of streaming. So there is a lot of great stuff out there. And I was thinking about that as I was um, updating my film class this last semester, there was so much on Netflix, on Amazon Prime, on Hulu that I can refer students to. Um, and they were, you know, a lot of them were what they would call independent features, right? Um, but they're getting watched and they're available and I don't have to go and hunt them down and find them somewhere. So I do have, um, I do have hope. And I think that this is part of the industry as a whole that there's more representations. But I think the other issue too that we, we're not dealing with in terms of Asian American representation is that um, they're still not available in the networks. So whereas you're seeing, you're still see, you're seeing larger numbers, sometimes not great representations either um, of Blacks and Latinx, you still don't see a lot of um, Asian Americans. Um, you hardly see any Pacific Islanders. Um, American Indians are also very, very small too. Thanks, Crystal. Great, thank you for these um, excellent questions from our audience and thank you so much Dr. Kuo for um, joining us tonight um, and for your wonderful talk and answering all of these questions. A lot of them are very hard hitting questions and um, a lot of really good comments in the chat from Susan and Carolyn and Donna. So thank you so much for participating in this conversation. Um, before everyone heads out as we're wrapping up um, this evening, um, there is gonna be a very short survey that you'll see when the webinar closes. It's just really quick four multiple choice questions that shouldn't take you more than 20 seconds to complete about this program. Um, so it'd be great if you could um, do that as you're heading out of this webinar really quick. And I also wanna make a quick plug for our upcoming programs. We have um, more uh, talks in this Representation Matter series. We have a talk um, by Dr. Karen Leong happening next Thursday at 6 p.m., so same time as this talk on um, the story of Chinese immigrants in the U.S. and who gets to be American. And then we have a talk the following week on May 13th, also Thursday at 6 p.m., by Dr. Joshua Sellers, who's going to be talking about who gets to vote and our voting rights um, here in Arizona. So that should be a really interesting talk. Um, to check out more about our programs, um, you can go to our website, azhumanities.org. And we'll be making this recording of today available on the Carver Museum website. So go to carveraz.org. It should be up um, in the coming weeks. And we'll also send out um, a notice to everyone who attended this webinar when those recordings are available. But I also wanna thank Dr. Karen Quill. Again, thank you so much for um, taking time to you know, share your knowledge and with all of us. And I think we all got a lot out of today's talk. So thank you so much. And also everyone else for taking some time in your evening to learn more about this topic. Yeah, thanks all for coming out um, to do this. And I'm sorry, it's all dark in here now, <laughs> like this shadow. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, um, have a good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>